Revelation chapter 9. Are you there already? Should be. We've been in the same chapter now for, what, since the Reagan administration? Since breakdancing? Revelation chapter 9. Got to be careful and delicate in my Bible. That, that page has been open too so many times. It's tear. It's torn. All right. Revelation chapter 9. Um, man, I'm looking at Revelation 10 already. We're going to be there a while too. Isn't that fun though? You get to go through the whole Word of God. Okay? Just looking at one book. Like we're going to do this morning. Revelation chapter 9. Um, let's, let's get the whole gist of this. Um, just to uh, stir up your remembrance. And Revelation 9 is the sounding of the fifth trumpet and later on the sixth trumpet. And um, when that trumpet sounds, the fifth trumpet, an, an angel, a star falls from heaven and to him so we know that it's it's an entity it, it has an intelligence to him was given the key of the bottomless pit and i would say more intelligence than uh let's say a horse or a hamster because if you give a key to a hamster would he unlock the door you wanted him to unlock nah wouldn't work so this one knew what to do with that key. So that angel, I, I believe it could be Satan, uh, falls. And you might say, well, didn't Satan fall? If you, look, if you look at the scriptures and go from Genesis all the way through, just about every time you see Satan, not every time, but just, time, just about every time you see Satan somewhere, he's falling. We know that in Genesis 3, he's already fallen. Uh, but we also know, I um, can't remember, it's Zechariah maybe, that Satan at that time had access to God in heaven. We know it in Job. He also had access to God in heaven because the sons of God came and Satan came also. And we also see it, I think it's in, I think it's in Zechariah where he sees... Uh, Joshua the high priest and Satan standing at his right hand. Uh, we also know that he's the accuser of the brethren. This is what the New Testament calls him. But we see him at different times falling. In Genesis 3, whatever legs he had, he loses them. He's going down. In Isaiah 14, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So we see him there. Uh, then Jesus, when he sends the 70 disciples out to witness and they come back and they say, you know, even the devils uh, obey us. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. He's falling then. But then we have um, Revelation 12, which we haven't got to yet. But we see the story of his fall in there. So... How do we how do we account for that? Um, as far as and and if and if I'm right here in Revelation nine is an account of his falling. Uh, also in Revelation six, we see all the stars of heaven or a third of the stars of heaven falling. So um, then he gets thrown in the bottomless pit, and for how long does he fall there? A thousand years. That is one long tunnel, okay? But he falls for a thousand years. So I, I, rather than trying to understand the timing of it, I, I do sort of get the idea of it. He is perpetually the fallen angel. He's always in a fallen state. He's pronounced fallen in Genesis 3 by the taking away of his legs. Isaiah 14, I think it's in Luke, where... Uh, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven. You see him in, um, I believe, Revelation 9, also Revelation 12, for sure you see it there. He's mentioned by name. So I think the idea is that he is always the fallen angel and will always be falling, all right? 
So, he opens up the pit, out come the locusts, out of the smoke of a great furnace. I think that is significant, but I just didn't get into that part of it. Um, but as the, the smoke comes out of a great furnace, and out of that smoke come locusts, but they're not ordinary locusts, and they're not Apache attack helicopters. Okay? Uh, the way late great Planet Earth book said. But they are devils. They are gods with a little g. They are uh, created entities created by God. He calls them in Joel his mighty army. Now that may seem odd, but if, the, if those locusts are doing the will of God, are they not God's army in some sense? Because, I mean, again, Revelation 9, the, the angel didn't steal the key. He didn't, um, he didn't already have it. It was given to him, and it was given to him for that purpose, to open up that pit. And that's exactly what he does with it. And knowing then that this army of locusts would come out. Now, the locusts, they have shapes of locusts, but they have the tails of scorpions. And anyway, we're going to read the description of them. Starting in verse 7, we'll go down to 11. Uh, we already dealt with the issue of their hair and as the hair of women faces of men. I talked about that yesterday down in Norwood. Uh, but anyway, verse 7. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared in a battle. You find that in Joel. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold. Uh, crowns represent authority. They would be given dominion. And their faces were as the faces of men. It's, this is a literal, this is John describing exactly what he sees. And they had the hair as the hair of women. So he is describing uh, androgynous beings. They are both male and female at the same time. If you want to understand the spirit that is going through this world right now, it's, a, it's crazy. It is absolutely insane. When, when did... When did the LGBTQ plus community start believing among themselves that their gender could be fluid? It could be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. They could just change their gender by their thought. And then you have to keep up with that or you'd be in trouble in California, in Canada. When did that happen? Uh, I don't ever remember in in younger days as long as as far back as i knew what a gay person was i don't ever remember hearing anybody talking about someone just switching genders from one day or one week to the next or one month to the next that is a new thing that's come up and i believe it's a spirit that is driving that it's guiding that when i Interviewed that, yep, yeah, well, here I am talking about it again. When I interviewed that boy out in Hillsboro, they put a dress on everything, and I mean, he, he looked right into my camera, and I asked the question, is it okay for boys to go in any girl's bathroom? And he said, it's not okay for a boy to go in a girl's bathroom. And he said, he looked right at me, and he said, I am not a boy. And I'm going, you got a Y chromosome. That means you're a boy. Your genetics don't change just because your mind thinks it. So anyway, um, that's a spirit. And I believe that it is in preparation for what's coming out of the pit. So then verse 8, and we're going to focus on this this morning. Their teeth are as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. Uh, I have that in my notes too. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots. Many horses running to battle. That is also Joel, the book of Joel. That's prophesied as Joel's army. So we have, I mean, we have the teeth of lions. We have the fact that they're locusts. That's in Joel. And God specifically said in Joel 3 that he's going to restore everything that the locusts took away. And he said, it's my great army. So he, uh, in verse 9 again, or verse 10, and they had tails like an scorpions. And there were stings in their tails. Think about, in the Bible, think about things that sting. Goads are mentioned in the Bible. When Jesus met the Apostle Paul, when he was Saul, he said, um, 
It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And we know what that is. It's a goad. When you goad an animal, you jab them with something. You ever done that, Sterling? Goaded a horse or a cow or something like that? Son-in-law? <laughs> you goad things. You poke them and sting them and get them to move along. Animals that sting. Wasps are mentioned in the Bible. Hornets mentioned in the Bible. Scorpions. The sting is the sting of what? Death. Okay? So, anyway, we'll get to that. Uh, and their power was to hurt men five months. That's also prophesied as well. Now, verse 11, very important verse. They had a king over them. Um, back in, I think it's Ecclesiastes or Proverbs, Solomon wrote that the locusts, they all traveled together as one band. And if you've ever seen a swarm of locusts, when, the, when part of the locust swarm turns, the whole rest of them turn instantly. It's like a school of fish. You get a big school of fish, and when one of them turns, they all turn. It's like their minds are connected somehow. But Solomon said that they all are banded together when they move, and yet they have no king over them. Now, that's what Solomon said. However, this locust army is different they have a king over them and that king is the angel of the bottomless pit uh, whose name in the hebrew tongue is abaddon but in the greek tongue hath his name apollyon now if that looks like apollo does that look like apollo to you there's a reason. There is a reason. I'll get to that. Um, who do you think that angel is? Who do you think it is? There's no wrong answer. Do what? Uh, Lucifer? No. No, I think, I think he's different than Lucifer. That's a good guess, though. You're close. Who do you think it is? I thought somebody would say Joe Biden or Hillary or something, you know, something like that. No answer? Abaddon and Apollyon are both Hebrew and Greek words that mean, huh? The destroyer. Now that word is in your Bible. Who did God send at the 10th plague? Who did he send? The destroyer. Okay. And that destroyer killed. He had the power of death, didn't he? Um, one of the primary gods of Hindu is Shiva. And you know who Shiva is? The destroyer. But uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll wait. Let's go back to verse 8. Their I'm going to leave you hanging for a few months. Their teeth were as the teeth of lions. About the time Steve and Jenny come back, I'll, we'll talk about it. Their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Okay? Um, look in Joel chapter 1. That's what I have up on the screen. And I want you to notice how God describes this group of scorpions. He's, he says in Joel... In fact, let's turn there because I want to give you a little bit more than those verses there. Joel chapter 1. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Um, he mentions in verse 4, that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath eaten hath left hath the canker worm eaten. Canker worm... Uh, what is the word canker? You ever had a canker sore? Uh, the word canker and the word cancer are the same word. And they both mean to eat. 
Okay, and that's what cancer does. Cancer cells don't have the um, the program cell death program in them. That's why cancer cells only grow; they don't die, like regular cells do. And canker or cancer cells, they just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And a canker worm, I mean, you've seen National Geographic videos or whatever of these worms just eating a leaf, and the whole leaf would be gone in about a minute or so, okay? So if you got a thousand worms on this one tree, in a matter of minutes, what's going to be, what's going to happen to all the leaves on that tree? Everyone's be gone. I read, I, re I went back and read again the, um, the plagues that God sent uh, to Egypt. It's, it's good to go back and actually read the text because you'll see things that you never read before there. Don't just think of the story. Go back and read the text. And uh, when God released locusts to Egypt, they literally cleaned up every... Now, you understand this. You're an Egyptian, and a locust plague has come in and has destroyed every blade of grass, every leaf, every green thing from every place where you live, where your garden is, where your crops are, and where your cattle graze. What's going to happen in a month or less? Everybody's going to starve to death because there's just nothing for them to eat and nothing for their cattle to eat. And they're going to die. And God said when they went out and saw that, there was a great wailing among the Egyptians. Anyway, um, so then the canker worm, whatever the canker worm left, the caterpillar ate. We have four different worms mentioned here. Four represents the spiritual realm. So in verse 5, he said, Awake ye drunkards and weep and howl. Uh, you've heard me say this. Uh, the time now to be sober is now. Okay, it's not a time uh, to be drunk either physically, on drugs, spiritually. It's not a time to be drunk spiritually. It's not a time for that. Now is a time of sobriety. Um, it's time to, to wise up to the way this world is going and ask the question... Are we ever going back to the good old days in America? It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. It, God described the wound of Israel as incurable. Now for God to say that a wound is incurable and he's the great healer, what does that say about that wound? Okay? But he says, Awake ye drunkards and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine because of the new wine. For it is cut off in your mouth. What does new wine represent? Well, Isaiah said new wine comes from the cluster. So it's that unfermented, uncorrupted wine. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. The fruit of those branches are the grapes. And he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, which means that if His Word abides in us, we will produce grapes, the fruit. And squeezing the juice out of those grapes, that was called wine. Because wine, the word wine, study English first. Before you learn any other language, study English. The word wine simply comes from the word vino, which means, what does that sound like, vino? Like an Italian mafia guy, right? Hey, vino. <laughs> no, it means the vine. It's from the vine. That's all the word wine means. From the vine. So anytime in the Bible you're reading, here's Jesus turning water to wine. Do we really believe that Jesus made everybody hopping drunk at this wedding feast? As his first miracle for all of the world to see, the King of kings and Lord of lords who desires every man to be sober, got everybody drunk at the wedding feast. Do we believe that? No. So there has to be an answer. And the word wine, it could either mean fresh grape juice or fermented. And the context tells you the difference. 
often wine is mentioned with strong when wine is mentioned with strong drink you know what kind of wine it is you don't have to ask it's out it's got alcohol in it and people get drunk okay um, there's a a Latin term in vino veritas anybody know what that means in vino veritas in wine is truth some people who don't usually talk, when they get a little wine in them, can't shut them up, and all of a sudden they're telling secrets that they know about everybody, that they've kept hidden. Anyway, that's a stupid thing. Anyway, anyway, the new wine is cut off. In other words, the truth of the Word of God has been taken away from them. It's cut off. So all they have left is that old, corrupted, drunkard, Mogan David, Mad Dog 2020 or whatever, that old wine. They don't get the doctrines. They don't understand the prophecies. And I'm talking about the Word of God. That has been cut off. What did Amos prophesy? God said, I'll, I'll send a famine in the land. What kind of famine was it? A famine, not a famine of bread, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. God is going to literally cut off. So, you've got all these churches now that are in a transition. And they are in a transition. Some have already gotten to what I would say the position of apostasy. Um, here lately, um, oh, who was it? That, uh, Charles Stanley passed away. Okay. I know I can't blame the sins of the son on him, so I won't. But his son, wherever his father stood on, on basic doctrines of the Bible, his son is way out there in left field. I mean, way out there. His son, and there's only one thing I know about him, is that he preached a message and he said, if, if we say that our faith and our belief and our trust in God comes from the Bible, he said, what if, the, what if we find out the Bible's wrong about something? What does that then say about our faith? And I'm going, don't you get that? I mean, I'll take that same question and say, Amen, hallelujah, that means the Bible's not wrong and it can't be wrong. Amen? Isn't that how you think? That's not how he thinks. He thinks we shouldn't put our faith and our trust and our confidence and get our salvation from the Word of God because I guess in his mind, he already has been taught or believes that the Bible is in fact wrong in significant places. So he does not put his faith, the belief system that he has, he does not put it in and base it upon the Word of God. If you don't base it on the Word of God, what are you going to base it on? A, a car salesman's story or a politician's promises or what? What are you going to base your eternal life on? If you can't trust the book that God said, trust it. So to me, he preaches this message everybody that says yeah that's right preacher that's right that's right preacher they've done exactly what Saul did Saul rejected the word of the Lord that's verbatim what Samuel said Saul did because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord God has rejected thee from being king yes sir oh that sound he said uh, that uh, what's his first name Andy Stanley he said um, Cubby said that he said that just because Jesus said something doesn't mean it's true somebody hit that guy with the back of the head with it before make maybe he'll wake up um, to me that that is you are you are committing the sin of Saul you've rejected the word of the Lord and after that the Bible says that God took his Holy Spirit away from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord entered him. And I'm telling you, 
Churches are in a transition right now. They've walked away in part from the truth, the King James. And the longer they go, the worse it gets. You say, well, you know, I've looked at the NIV or the, let's say the ESV and it's close to the King James. Maybe today. But there are five different versions of the NIV that have come out since 1980 and they're all different from one another. They keep changing the Bible. You see what's going on? As long as they keep altering the Word of God, they never alter it to be more right. They continue to change it to be more wrong. And that's, that's one of the billions of reasons why we're going to stick with one Bible and not even mess with the rest of them. Amen? So that, anyway, that's the new wine. It's cut off from them. And then he said... Verse 6, for a nation has come upon my land. Now, notice that God calls this army a nation. The word nation simply means, uh, we, we use it to define borders and boundaries on land. But biblically speaking, a nation was, if you go back to Genesis 10 and read Genesis 10, you're going to find that God divided the world up into 72 different families. And he said, thus, were, by these were the nations divided. So, um, even now, if we say somebody is Italian, they could be from New Jersey. But what are they? Italian, okay? Uh, just, if you don't believe that, go up on the hill, okay? <laughs> and ask those people, are you an American? No, I'm an Italian, okay? Uh, they, that's how they identify themselves, is by their people, who they're from. Uh, we do the same, and, and, and every group does it to some extent. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. God is the one who divided them up. And for whatever reason, uh, there are differences between different peoples. Not good or bad, it's just different. But he, this particular case, he calls this a nation. So we're dealing, and there are spiritual nations. And in this case, that's what we're dealing with. A spiritual nation has come upon my land strong and without number. There's another clue there. They're huge. It is a very... And I, I looked at that phrase without number. I don't know if I made notes on it. Yeah, I did. And which is interesting. It's found 11 times. 11 is a number for confusion in the Bible. And anytime you see the phrase without number, it shows that it's an indefinite amount. Uh... Job 5, God doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. It means we'll never be able to count them. He spake and the locusts came and caterpillars and that without number. That, I believe, is a reference to what we're de dealing with. Psalm 104, 25, so is this great and wide sea wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. Innumerable basically means without number. Um, Hebrews 11, Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. Angels are considered innumerable. Uh, Hebrews 12, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. And you may have heard me mention that before, that the, the angels are like the stars. They, they just not, it is not possible for us to count them. They're like the sand all over the earth. And how much, how many grains of sand exist on the earth? There's no way. There is no way to even guess and, and be close to being right. So it is without number. It's a, it's a phrase that speaks of things that are indefinite. Um, and when I looked at it, I didn't like that. I'll be honest with you. I like for my Bible to be sure about something. Okay, but this phrase, without number, it's meant to, I think, it's meant to overwhelm us with how incredibly huge it is. Okay? In other words, when this army shows up, um, when I was reading about the locusts in Egypt last night, the Egyptians were absolutely overwhelmed by the amount of locusts that showed up. 
And, and the Bible says that they literally got into every place, including the palace, Pharaoh's own house. You couldn't lock the doors. You couldn't shut the windows. You could not keep them out. They were in very quickly and they had to deal with them while they're... Can you imagine, ladies or men, standing in a room full of locusts flying around, buzzing, crawling up and down your face? Okay? You've got people freaking out of their minds, going mad because these locusts are everywhere. When God does something like this, folks... People aren't going to go, that's nothing. It ain't going to happen that way. Um, let's look at the lion's teeth for a minute while we got before the bell rings. Psalm 57, 4. Now, uh, understand that since we're looking at spirit beings, often in the Bible, you will find angels that have multiple creatures for their body parts the angels that um, that carry the throne of God in Ezekiel 1 they have four faces facing four directions one face is that of a lion one is that of an eagle one is of an ox and the other one is of a man now they have the body of a man but then again they have the feet as calves feet that's weird. And they have, have regular arms and hands like a man, uh, but they've got four wings like, uh, like a butterfly does. And so, I mean, there's just different, different creatures blended together. And this is what you get. However, um, well, let me get into this. My soul is, David said, my soul is among lions. Now, when he mentions the soul... He's not necessarily talking about what is eating his flesh. Understand that. He's not surrounded. He's not in a lion's pit per se. He is, however, spiritually in a lion's pit. He is, his soul is surrounded by spirits. Does that make sense to everybody? Have you ever had lions growling at you uh, in your soul? I've had them, okay? I've mean, had them in Kenya. I've had them here, uh, but I've had them. What, what, or whatever they were, I've had those beasts trying to tear at me, and I knew it. I knew it was going on. I knew what was happening. I had experienced it before. I will experience it again. There is no doubt of that whatsoever. But that's what he's talking about. My soul is among lions. So he said, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth. Now, now, if he says this now, he's speaking in a literal manner in the spirit realm. Their teeth, these lions, their teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue, a sharp sword. Let me ask you this. They say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never harm me. Is that true? You can cut somebody in half with words. You can destroy somebody with words. You can practically kill somebody who may be in a weakened state with the right words. It can happen. So their tongue, a sharp sword... It's not an imagination, it's not a stretch, it's not a metaphor, it's real. And, and I think devils, well, I think they're, they're designed to do this. So I was telling, I was telling my aunt about uh, time going to Kenya where I had these devils all over me. She asked me, she said, did you, did you rebuke them in the name of Jesus? I, she said, did you talk to them? And I said, what do you mean? She said, did you tell them to leave in the name of Jesus? And I said, no, I don't talk to them. I make a phone call to God. That's the only thing I know how to do is make a call to God and say, God, get rid of them. And I said, now, he didn't get rid of them immediately. He didn't do that. 
he waited and had me wait out the night. What was he doing? He was teaching me, number one, about suffering, which is appointed to all of us. Number two, he was teaching me how to do warfare. Teach me how to fight. Teach me how not to give in. To give in would have been, I would have went and got Lisa up, she would have got you and you two up, and we would have found a plane out the next day. As hard as it was to get there, we were going to leave. That would have been giving in to them. But God wanted to teach me how not to give in. Does that make sense? So next time you're surrounded by lions or anything where their words are like a sharp sword and their teeth. Is, what does the devil throw at us? Fiery darts. Is that real? You better believe it is. He's attacking our faith because that's the only way to defend it is what you believe about the Bible. Okay? Father, bless your word. Thank you, Lord, for it. Lord, it's an amazing, amazing book. Lord, I would... I'd like to just stay here and teach the whole thing, but to be honest with you, God, I'd rather be sitting up in heaven with you while you teach it. So, Lord, have your will in our lives. We love you and we thank you for this awesome, awesome study book that you've given us. Blessed in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.